grace and peace to you and to our friends across the courtyard in C2 worshiping grace and peace to you and to my family and friends that are watching grace and peace will you pray with me God of grace and mercy you hold us faithfully in your covenant your love upholds us Your grace moves ahead of us. Your mercy comes to us in surprising ways. Open our hearts to welcome the message of your promise and to trust your blessing. I pray that my words are faithful to your words and that you will speak through me or if needed, speak in spite of me. Amen. Unless it is football season and the Patriots are on, I'm not much of a television watcher. At least that was true until I discovered Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan series with John Krasinski and Wendell Pierce. Have you seen it? Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's an American political action thriller where CIA analysts uncover world corruption and terrorism through intrigue, espionage, and conspiracy theories. Their knowledge and problem-solving skills guide their intelligence, surveillance, secret maneuvers, and narrow escapes. Each episode ends with a shocking revelation, leaving you wondering what's going to happen next, causing you to think about all the scary possibilities, leading you on to watch another episode. At times, I would convince Dave that we needed to watch just one more episode. I think they call that binge watching when you watch several episodes in one sitting. And with the writer's strike, maybe some of you are waiting for your next episode of your favorite show. Maybe some of you watch Yellowstone or Outlander or Bridgerton. Rachel is waiting for season three of Good Omens. And Suzanne in the office is waiting for the next episode of Virgin River. Dave is hoping that the new season of his favorite drama, The New England Patriot Nation, (laughs) has a better script than last year. (laughs) He'll find out tonight. Just like a television series that ends with a cliffhanger, the book of Genesis leaves us white-knuckled with each generational story. The epic background of the first 11 chapters depict one human failing after another. Adam and Eve's debacle in the Garden of Eden, the murder of Abel by Cain, his brother, Most of humanity wiped out by a flood, and then the catastrophe of the Tower of Babel, where humanity wanted to make a name for themselves, overstepped their boundaries, only to have God scatter them across the face of the earth. At the end of the 11th chapter, the world was a landscape of sin and shame, chaos and confusion, hostility and and estrangement. It seems like the beginning of the world could have just as easily been the end of it. God had given humanity a chance, and we had thrown it away. It's a wonder that God did not leave us to our own devices, wallowing in deceit and spiraling downward in dysfunction. But then, a spotlight swept across the dark biblical stage and came to rest on the quiet figure of Abram. From out of the blue, in the beginning of chapter 12, God reached out to humanity once more and spoke to Abram, who God later named Abraham. God told Abraham to leave his country, his family, and his father's house and go to a country that God would show him. 
only with a promise of future blessing in return. While we might be accustomed to traveling to another country, for Abraham, this was a pretty big deal. It meant leaving behind every single thing that gave him his identity. His ancestors' graves, his home, his land, his friends. God called Abraham to leave all of this behind him and travel to a land promised by God. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you, God said. I will make your name great and people of all the earth will be blessed through you. And Abram, at the age of 75, went with his wife, Sari, who later became Sarah. Along the journey, God told Abraham, I am going to give you so many descendants that like dust, they cannot be counted. After they were settled in Hebron near the oaks of Mamre, God told Abraham, look into the nighttime sky and count the stars if you can. Your descendants will be like that, too many to count. Well, today's reading from Genesis 18 takes place 25 years later. And guess what? Abraham is about 99 years old, and Sarah is almost 90. And guess what? They still don't have any children. Inconceivable. What's up with that? All those years of following God's call, all those years of living on a promise, all those years of waiting, and no child? How can Abraham be the father of the nations without an heir? We can only imagine the doubt, the hopelessness, the disappointment they must have felt from time to time. And now, in their late stage of life, the idea of a promised child would seem improbable, preposterous, inconceivable. But in chapter 18, the plot thickens. As Abraham sat by the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, the Lord appeared to him in the form of three men. His Middle Eastern culture of hospitality got Abraham swiftly to his feet and into quick action, asking Sarah to whip up a lavish feast for the travelers. The men sat to eat as Abraham stood by, continuing to serve them. Where is your wife, Sarah? One of the men asked. Okay, here's the first clue, that these were not just ordinary sojourners. How did they know her name? She's there in the tent, Abraham said. Then came the astonishing pronouncement. About this time next year, your wife Sarah will have a son. Can you imagine how this announcement was dropped into the midst of a drowsy luncheon conversation? Like a stone follow, falling into perfectly still water, sending shock waves of ever widening ripples. Surely, Abraham wondered if the fulfillment of God's promise, so long delayed, might finally come. Abraham, who was probably flabbergasted, stood rooted in his spot as the realization slowly dawned on him that at this meal, he had been entertaining God. And Sarah, who had been eavesdropping from inside the tent, laughed at this inconceivable proclamation. I think I would too. This was shocking news. I wonder, was it a giggle of nervousness, a chuckle of astonishment, a snicker of delight, or perhaps a snort of impossibility? Whatever the reason, the men responded to her laughter without scolding or shaming. 
but instead with an offer of further hope. In the interaction between the visitors and Sarah, the strength of God was revealed. God asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is there anything too difficult for me? Many years later, in the Gospel of Matthew, the angel Gabriel reassured the Virgin Mary, another woman who was contemplating the inconceivable, with a strikingly similar question. Is anything too difficult for God? That is the moment where humanity and the divine meet. It's the ancient question of God's people, the question that echoes in all of our places of doubt and disbelief. When we wonder at the promises of God, when we fail to comprehend the extent of God's ability to work in us and through us, is there anything too wondrous for God? In Abraham and Sarah's story, we have a powerful example of what happens when God shows up to fulfill our deepest hopes. We are in a place of laughter. Not the laughter of joy and happiness, but the laughter of disbelief and astonishment. Why did Sarah laugh? Because she was old and children are born to the young. Because it's what we humans do when we are faced with the possibility of more than our limited minds can grasp. Sometimes we don't know how to respond in those circumstances. We are incredulous with our laughter, unwilling or unable to accept the idea that God might actually accomplish what God promised. Can you believe in promises? Even when we can't see a way forward, it's your senses and your imagination that are going to attack belief, author and theologian C.S. Lewis said. The conflict is not between faith and reason, but between faith and sight. When we can't see God at work, it's easy to lose faith in God's ability to redeem us and to redeem the world. We can easily feel abandoned or alone. What is the thing in your life that you have prayed about for years? The hope that you have longed for, the relationship that you have waited for, the conflict that you can't see a way through. Do you still have faith that God will answer your prayer? It is clear from the scriptures that faith is an essential element in our approach to God. The problem we face is to know what faith entails. Some of us may think that faith is a doubt-free reliance on God, believing that God will do what we want God to do, as long as we can muster up some kind of doubt-free faith. Faith is a dependence, a firmness, a trust in God's word, promises, and covenant agreement with us. It relies on the idea that God will do what God promises because nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Faith is trusting not in our own desires and abilities, but rather in the inconceivable promises of God. I'm not suggesting that our faith in God must be doubt-free. Jesus said faith as small as a mustard seed can move the mountain. Our trust in God's promises may well be, probably will be, filled with doubt. But trust is what is important, not doubt. Initially, Abraham believed and finally Sarah believed. They trusted in God's promise, even with all their many questions, doubts, and fears. So what are some of God's promises? What are some of the assurances that we have from the scriptures? Here are the ones that I am holding on to as I prepare to leave this place. 
as I leave my ancestors' graves, as I leave this land and my home and my friends. Perhaps these are promises that you need to remember as well. Isaiah 41 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. From Jeremiah 29, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Joshua 1 says, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. These are the promises I will keep with me in the coming days and weeks. And I know I can count on God to go with me all the way to Hilton Head. God always fulfills God's promises at the set time. God fulfills promises that are wonderful and amazing and awesome. Nothing is beyond God. But it comes to us at God's appointed time. A time that may not make sense to us, but makes perfect sense in God's time. Maybe what God was really saying to Sarah when she laughed at that promise was, I know it's hard to believe what I've promised. Everything about this seems topsy-turvy to the way things should be. You did laugh, but that's okay. You're not the first nor the last to laugh at what seems impossible. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. The word of God was fulfilled. And Sarah and Abraham were gifted with a child, even in their old age, even though Isaac was inconceivable. Maybe some of you, like Sarah, think your age is an obstacle to God. I know at age 50, I thought I was much too old to go to seminary. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote that age is opportunity, no less than youth. And though today's society champions the young as models of vision, vigor, and imagination, the Bible portrays quite another story. God chose many senior citizens as key characters to move the human divine story forward many years past their prime, even according to our standards. Noah was 600 years old when God told him to build the ark. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was described as getting on in years. And Anna, the prophetess, was 84 when she encountered the baby Jesus. Age is revered in the scripture as a sign of favor. The ancient patriarchs and matriarchs named in the genealogies are esteemed for their long life and wisdom. We admire the enthusiasm and freshness of youth, which bubbles over like champagne, but from the elderly, we can gain deep wisdom, which has been aged in the casks of experience, flavored by success and failure, distilled in both gain and loss, and now embodies the fullness of life. Perhaps only those accustomed to watching the mysterious ways of God can recognize the Almighty's fingerprints on the pages of time and on a life. Scripture reminds us that no one is ever too old to receive God's fresh promises. Trust, therefore, in God 
the faithful one, and continue to hope. For hope ignites life, laughter, and generosity, even in the twilight of one's years. Go ahead and laugh. Chuckle in disbelief when you hear God's hope for this world expressed in the scriptures. It's inconceivable. Snicker with doubt that God will ever answer your prayers. God is patient and faithful and will always keep promises. Abraham and Sarah took the road marked out by God. It was the beginning of God's blessing for all the world. And now God comes to us once more in the splendor of love. Instead of a table set by Abraham and Sarah for their three visitors, now it's our three-personed God who has set the table, and we are the guests. Guests of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come and laugh with Abraham and Sarah, and find hope for your hopelessness, joy for your sorrow, purpose for your life, and the never-failing guidance of the Lord your God, whose presence may at any moment Invade your tent and your table with astonishment, laughter, and joy. May it be so for you as well as us as our roads part. Amen. Unbelievably, on December 29th, 2019, Elizabeth was ordained and married, and she decided to get it all done at one time, I guess. (laughs) And she asked me to uh, write a poem for her ordination. And um, it starts, it begins with an epigraph from John Keats. When I, when I was writing this, um, it was a good exercise for me because I had to think about what she was actually doing. And uh, I never thought about ministers before in the same way, what they, what they actually do for us and who they are for us. The epigraph is, Call the world, if you please, the veil of soul-making. The veil of soul-making. Then you will find out the use of the world. John Keats. Dearest one, you have stepped forth from among us to don the cloth, to acquaint yourself with our sadnesses and share in our joy. Henceforth, your eyes will open upon a wilderness grown inside all of us, a desert that claims our hearts and lands we must cross together arm in arm. You will know and attend our demise and marry our difficulties unto your own. Watch us appear and disappear as you wonder, worry, and weep. You will be a founder of hope, a giver of light, and witness of their deepest demise. You are an angel and a fool, guardian and sufferer, and the last victim of your own despair. You will be blessed and harmed, radiant and quenched, a wick safe within us to illumine the darkness and help us find the morning. You are brave and will become more so. You are fearful and things to be afraid of will not diminish. 
You are a sacrifice. What danger and pleasure you seek, following in your Father's footsteps. You have always been these things. How could this be if it were not so? You were chosen, even as you choose, to hold us in your hands, not at arm's length, not at the bound of your vision, but within the full embrace of your heart. <clears throat> 